as we get started, I was thinking, you know, there's a real, lot of really great things, a lot of really great things about children's books and TV shows. Um, what what TV shows, what kids' books or TV shows do you remember like growing up watching? Shout it out. What do you got? Dora. Dora, yes. Dora. 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 Little Bear. Wild Kratz. Oh, so good. Bears. My Little Pony. My Little Pony. P W N Y. Pony. I printed 70 notes. So uh, if we got extras. Backyardigans? No? Samurai Jack. Davey, last one. Odd Squad. Odd Squad. Look, there's a lot of great things about, uh, a lot of great things about kids' TV shows. One of the things, one of the things that kids' TV shows really seem to emphasize is always like life lessons, right? Life lessons. Um, one of those lessons that pops up often in kids' TV shows is like, how do we get along? How do we have good relationships? How do we make friends? Um, and you know, as a teenager or an adult, you might look back now and go like, that stuff is kind of cheesy. But maybe there's a reason that those things get emphasized a whole lot in those kind of shows. And I think they're repeated because you know what, as we get older, like those lessons, like we realize like our relationships, our, our friendships, those things, life just tends to get more complicated. When we were four or five years old, it was easy to be like, I'm going to be a good friend, and I'm going to go make friends, and I'm going to be nice to people, and I'm going to be kind to people. But you know what? When you get older, it's not so easy to just be nice and kind to people anymore, is it? Uh, it's not as easy, especially when you're a teenager. Uh, well, hey, look, the Bible gives us wisdom in how to live, and if we're Jesus followers, then the Bible is our authority on all things pertaining to our life. And the Bible has a lot to say about how we relate to others, um, because guess what? Getting along with people is challenging no matter how old you are. So uh, we're going to be jumping in. We're going to be in Romans 12 tonight. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. Otherwise, it is on the notes and on this one screen that we have. Uh, so uh, keep praying that the screen works. After Jesus' death and resurrection, the Apostle Paul, one of the most famous uh, people in the early church, began traveling around the known world and he was planting churches. He was visiting cities, he was helping Jesus followers start their churches and helping them know what it was to follow Jesus. As he would travel around, he would write letters to these cities that eventually came to be uh, our books of the New Testament. Within about 20 years or so of Paul going on all these missionary journeys and helping start all these churches, the church had spread farther than just about anyone could have ever imagined. What started with just a few people in Jerusalem, you know, in this tiny little sliver of the Middle East, became this huge movement that stretched all over the known world, even as far as Rome, which was about 1,500 miles away just by boat. Imagine if you're having to walk that or, uh, or ride on a horse or something to get there and take much longer. In order to encourage the church in Rome, Paul wrote this letter that we have now that we call the Book of Romans. And in chapter 12, he addresses an issue that the early church in Rome faced. Let's look at verse 18. It tells us, do all that you can to live at peace with everyone. Do all that you can to live at peace with everyone. Paul is writing to a group of Jesus followers. And what's significant about this group is that they are being persecuted for their faith. And you know, if we read a verse like this, okay, do all that you can to live at peace with everyone, we might go like, okay, well, everyone, like, I guess like other Christians, like other people in my church, maybe some people in my community. Paul's got to be talking about people in the church, right? Because if they're being persecuted, there's no way they got to live at peace with their enemies. Here's a little advice. Whenever you find yourself reading a single verse of scripture, it's important to go back and read what came before. So when you, we read a short passage like, do all that you can to live at peace with everyone, we need to go back and back up a few verses. This way we can get more of what we call context. What is Paul actually talking about here? And we can see what does this passage really mean? So to better understand, let's back up to verse 14. And Paul writes, Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. 
pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy. And weep with those who are weep. Uh, with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. And don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see that you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Do you notice how when we add the context to the rest of the verse, how much more meaningful that passage becomes? Maybe even how much more difficult that passage becomes? Because if we only read verse 18 by itself, and we know that Paul's just writing to a bunch of church people in Rome, we might think that Paul's just saying, hey, Christians, get along with each other. But then we read the context and we realize Paul is talking about something much bigger than just the church. And he's talking about something that's much more difficult. Paul is telling this Roman church, don't just get along with each other, but also do everything that you can now to live at peace with everyone, including your enemies. Yes, even the people who are persecuting you. And beyond that, he says, and go so far as to pray that God would bless them. Bless the people who are persecuting you? I'm curious what it must have been like for that church in Rome to receive Paul's letter and to open it up and to read those words out loud for the first time. Now, there's some debate over maybe when Paul wrote uh, exactly the, the, this, this book of Romans, probably sometime between 55 and 58 AD, which means that we can understand a little bit of the context, uh, not just biblically, but historically, of what was happening in Paul's day at that time. The Roman church would have been reading this letter within the first few years of the emperor Nero's rule. During Nero's rule, the persecution of Christians became increasingly violent. And this is most likely caused by a couple reasons. First, the Christians were kind of seen as problematic because they wouldn't worship all of the Roman gods and goddesses. Now, this wasn't exactly illegal in their culture, but for a people group to do this, like the Christians, it was kind of seen as subversive and countercultural. So they, people didn't really like that. They just wanted to like, follow the status quo. The second reason Christians were the target of this growing persecution in Rome was because traditionally the Roman emperor would kind of like consider themselves a god, a deity, worthy of worship. Nero took this to the extreme of associating himself with the Roman god of the sun, Sol. And to be honest, he was just really upset that people would worship anything other than him. So for Christians who worshipped Jesus, they became one of the prime targets of Nero's rage. And when it came to the Christians, unfortunately, Emperor Nero was really brutal. Sure, it might have started out small, but the persecution grew. And just a few years after Paul wrote Romans, Nero took things to a level that no one was expecting. In AD 64, a massive fire engulfed the city of Rome. And most historians agree that uh, Nero was probably the one who started the fire. Uh, he was, he was kind of crazy. He was really paranoid. Um, but Nero blamed it on the Christians who lived in the city. Nero then used the fire as a huge reason to begin persecuting the Christians on a scale that no one would have been able to imagine. Nero was famously brutal. He would have Christians arrested, dipped in oil, crucified, set on fire just for his pleasure. He was sick. Nero was the guy who started the practice of having the Christians fight in the Colosseum just so that he could enjoy watching them be murdered. while Paul's writing this in the mid-AD50s, and Nero's persecution wouldn't hit its height for maybe eight to ten more years, the point is that Paul's writing this letter, like, right, like, life was already getting difficult for these Christians. The citizens of first century Rome, they didn't have bluey to tell them to be kind to each other. Right? So now we have this context of what's happening in Rome, what's happening in Paul's day. How are the Christians being treated, and how much worse would it get? 
And so when we look then at Romans 12, 18, in its historical and its biblical context, and Paul says, do all that you can to live at peace with everyone. <coughs> Knowing what was going on for them, it seemed challenging before. Now, this, this feels impossible. I can almost hear the early readers of Paul's letter in this Roman church going, you want me to do what now? You expect, you expect what? I'm supposed to live how? You know what they're doing to us, right? And in the end, it's likely that a lot of the people in this early church in Rome who read Paul's letter would have been killed for their faith. In fact, an early church historian, he goes by the name Eusebius, claimed that Paul himself was ordered to be beheaded by Nero sometime late in, in, in maybe the late 60s AD. So Paul says, yes, I'm writing this to you. Live at peace with everyone. And not just for you, church in Rome, but I'm going to follow it too, Paul says. Even if it takes his life. Right? So this letter, this, this Romans letter written, you know, about 2,000 years ago. Thousands of miles away in a totally different context and culture. You know, so different from ours. But one of my favorite things about scripture is that there's so much we can learn from it when we really dig in and we try to understand it and we want to live it out through the power of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> and so I want to talk about a couple ideas that maybe come to mind when it seems like peace is impossible. First, peace is still the goal. Peace is still the goal. It would be really easy to compare ourselves with the lives of the Roman Christians and think like, Oh, that's for ancient people. That was for them back then. Like, Paul didn't understand today what we'd be going through. It's different. Maybe it doesn't apply to us. But that would be a really hasty and incorrect conclusion to arrive to. Because this idea of seeking peace is, is found throughout Scripture. Um, not only is it one of the fruits of the Spirit, but it's part of God's character. I mean, we could turn to places like Proverbs 16, the wisdom of Solomon that says, When people's lives please the Lord, even their enemies are at peace with them. We could look at Jesus in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the peacemakers. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. The more you read scripture, you see peace is part of God's character. It's a big part of who he is. It's not the only part of who he is, but it is, it is a big part of who he is. Um, we talked about this last week when we said reconciliation starts with God. God was the one who began to make a way for peace with us so that we can have a relationship with him. And so when peace is the goal, we get this opportunity to join in what God is doing in the world. But that can't happen if we're focused more on like getting even with others than making peace with others. Something else uh, that I think we, we can't miss um, is that really working for peace requires that everyone involved needs to get on the same page. And while that might be unlikely at first, we gotta recognize peace starts with at least one person taking the first step. Peace starts with one person. In life, you can't always choose how people treat you, but you can choose how you will respond. And in situations where maybe you're treated poorly, poor, poorly uh, people that hurt you or offended you, if you respond with retaliation, you are all but guaranteed to move further and further away from peace. And that's why Paul says in verse 17, never pay back evil with more evil. Now, when we read that, it might sound like Paul is saying that the victim is the only one responsible for resolving the conflict. But I don't think that captures the full idea of what Paul's getting at here. Instead, I think that Paul's pointing out that when we're in the middle of a conflict, we really have two choices. We can make it worse, or we can make it better. And if we have a choice, then we should always choose to work toward making things better, not worse. We can't make that choice for the other person, but at some point, if the conflict's ever going to be resolved, someone's got to go first. Why not let it be us? If peace is the goal, don't wait for someone else to make the choice. Step out and go first. And that's why Paul includes, I mean, the first six words of verse 18 are so important. He says, do all that you can to. Do all that you can to. He could have just said, live at peace with everyone. A much shorter verse, easier to memorize. But he didn't. He says, do all that you can to live at peace with everyone. 
And that's a big deal. Because he's telling us peace doesn't just happen. You've got to want it. You've got to step out. It's a process that involves everyone. But someone's got to go first. Someone's got to be willing to take the first step. And we should be the ones willing to take that first step as Jesus followers. So how do we do this? What does this look like? How do we live it out in our lives? Peace is a big thing. Resolving conflict, handling conflict as Jesus followers is a big deal. And guess what? As long as you're alive, you're going to run into conflict. So let's practice how to do this now and have a biblical approach. Last week, we talked about offering forgiveness and seeking reconciliation. If you find yourself then in the middle of a conflict, um, there's a couple steps I think we can start taking toward peace. And tonight is not the final word on this. We've got a few more sessions in this series where we're going to continue to talk about it. But for tonight, I think one of the things you need to do is determine your level of conflict. You say, Pastor Rich, what does that mean? The word conflict is a bit vague, right? Conflict could mean anything from like, I've got a minor disagreement with my younger sibling, or conflict could mean World War II, right? Like conflict is, is a little bit vague. So let's break down conflict into some different levels. Um, and we can talk through these, we can think about, you know, as you think about the conflicts you go through or maybe the conflicts you have in your life that are unresolved, what level of conflict are you at? Level one, uh, maybe this is the level of like, we just kind of don't like each other. At some point, you're gonna meet people in life uh, who you just don't get along with. Doesn't necessarily mean you have some kind of major conflict with them, but it's also not super peaceful when you're around them. There's just this tension. And this type of conflict usually isn't the end of the world. Uh, in fact, like this is the kind of conflict that we're more likely to kind of sweep away. Like if we just ignore it, maybe it'll go away. But if we're not careful, this type of conflict can actually grow into something worse. Um, unfairly judging people without ever attempting that peaceful relationship, all kinds of prejudice, things like that. Um, so level one, we just don't like each other. Level two conflict, maybe a minor offense has been committed. Uh, in this type of conflict, maybe someone's done something against you. It's not maybe a major issue, but like it bugs you, it irritates you, it annoys you. Um, maybe this person has done something uh, that's caused you to feel left out, right? They had a bunch of friends over, you didn't get invited, you didn't know about it until the day after, and you saw it, you heard about it, and you're like, I'm annoyed, I'm, I'm agitated, I'm, I'm offended. Maybe it's this person who's just got this habit of like cutting you off whenever you're talking, and you're like, I can't even get a word out, like stop it. Or maybe it's this kind of person who like, always is drawing attention to themselves and like your whole friend group kind of knows it, or you're maybe irritated. Um, these offenses might be minor, but they might not be minor to you. They might kind of feel like a big deal. Interestingly, when we deal with this kind of offense, sometimes the other person doesn't even know that they've hurt us or offended us. Sometimes it's just like how they like just act all the time and they're not even aware of how it affects people or that they've upset you. So maybe it's a minor offense. Level three though, maybe it's a major offense. Maybe a major offense has been committed. And this is the level where like things start to escalate pretty significantly. This is a bigger deal. It goes beyond just not getting along. And like the other person probably knows that at some level they hurt you or offended you or they've done something. Maybe you found out they were talking about you. They were spreading rumors behind your back. Maybe they're not even hiding it anymore. They're just mean right to your face. It's also possible, like, maybe this used to be like a minor thing that went on too long and now it's become just bigger and more hurtful. But now the conflict's serious. It has the potential to deal some long-term damage, negative consequences if we don't resolve it quickly. Conflict like this has the tendency to become all-consuming. It's all you focus on, it's all they focus on, and it can quickly spiral out of control. Level four conflict, you mean there's one that's worse? Yes, there is. Uh, level four conflict would say, I'm in danger, the situation isn't safe. Um, and this, not everyone gets to this level, but sometimes we find ourselves in places like this. Um, maybe you're afraid for your safety. Maybe you're just concerned about the safety of someone else. You know that things are really bad. Um, if you ever find yourself in this conflict, you need to reach out to someone you trust right away. A trusted adult, uh, someone who can help uh, walk through this with you. If you don't have people like that in mind, I can be one of those people, your small group leaders can be one of those people. We'll do whatever we can to help make sure you are safe. Once you determine how serious the conflict is, your next step, you're gonna love this one. Your next step is to own your share of the conflict. You're like, wait, wait, I, I, thought, I thought this was about the other person. 
Yeah, right? No, 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 no. Before we get to that, we gotta talk about ourselves. Because the reality is, and while it's not always the case, it is often the case that the conflict involves offenses by more than just one person. If two people are involved in the conflict, chances are, at some level, maybe both of you are responsible. And when we're trying to figure out the steps we need to take toward peace, it can be helpful to explore and ask the question, what role did I play? How did I contribute to the conflict in some way? And what's hard about that is you and I, we're usually really super quick to jump to the response of, no, 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 it's all their fault. I'm innocent, I haven't done anything. And we never really examine our own thoughts or motives or actions <laughs> or behaviors. Self-reflection isn't always easy. It can be a little bit painful sometimes because we actually have to admit when maybe we've done wrong. There was one time Jesus was teaching about this. Matthew 7, Jesus says, why worry about the speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own eye? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of the speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite! First get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. The truth is, is it's so much easier to call out the fault in someone else than it is to admit even obvious flaws and faults in our own lives. Jesus and Paul are challenging us to a higher standard. And so that means we have to ask ourselves some tough questions. Questions like, did I do anything to contribute to the conflict? <clears throat> Have I done anything, maybe in retaliation, that has made this worse? What have I said? What have I done? What have I contributed that might have caused pain for the other person? And I'll be the first one to say, like, those are not easy questions to answer. Sometimes we can't see our own motives and actions clearly. Sometimes it's really uh, helpful to encourage someone else to weigh in, and I'm not talking about run to a friend and gossip all about what the other person did. I'm talking about like reach out to a trusted mentor or a small group leader, someone who's objective, right? Someone who's got your best interest at heart, someone you trust, but someone who's gonna call you out. They're gonna tell you the truth, even if it's difficult to hear. <coughs> and if you realize that yes, you are responsible at whatever level in the conflict, even the smallest piece, I want to challenge you to own it. Don't try to ignore it. Don't try to convince yourself, well, it's not as bad as what the other person did. That's not helpful. And it doesn't move the conflict anywhere closer to a peaceful resolution. If you've done or said something, be quick to apologize. And even if that person doesn't want to forgive you right away at first, admitting fault is your step in taking responsibility and can be a meaningful step toward peace. Chances are that person will think about, oh, well maybe, maybe, maybe I need to revisit this idea. Maybe I need to see about what I've done. And here, this is really important, guys, don't miss this. Once you've owned it, once you've apologized for it, you need to be really mindful about what you do moving forward. Because if you're trash talking people, and then you go and apologize for it, but then you go right back out and start trash talking people again, they're not gonna take your apology very seriously. You're not gonna move the needle toward peace in a meaningful way. Be aware of how your actions affect others. Now, like I said, this is just part of the conversation on conflict. We're gonna continue this in the next few weeks. And this isn't gonna solve every single conflict, but if you're willing to take these steps, evaluate your conflict, own your part in it, be quick to apologize, more often than not, you're gonna find yourself moving conflicts toward peace. And here's the deal. If you're in conflict with another Jesus follower, they should have the same attitude as well. You should both be eager to quickly resolve conflicts. And when we do that, what a joy it is. Not only among brothers and sisters in Christ, but also it gives glory to God because God is the one who makes a way for us to be reconciled. Remember, peace is the goal. So let's pray. We're going to head to small groups next, just a time where we can discuss and talk more about this, what, how, how do we apply it to our own lives. Uh, and if you don't know where you're going for small group tonight, uh, chances are you'll probably go with the friend who brought you. Or if you're still uncertain, talk to me, and we'll make sure you get to the right small group. Let's pray. 
Father God, thank you for tonight, for a chance to, God, honestly, hear some hard truth. Navigating conflict when we've been hurt, when we've been offended, when we've been wronged, it's hard to do and it doesn't always feel right. But we know you're a good God. We know that you are the author of reconciliation. You desire for your children, Jesus' followers, to live in harmony, not only with each other, but with the people around us. And Father, I pray that we would actually take that seriously. That we would really strive for peace. And tonight we wouldn't just hear this message and you go, ah, no, it's good for someone else, but not for me. No, it's good for all of us. So God, would you just help us? Would you convict us? If we've done wrong, that we'd be quick to reconcile. We'd be quick to apologize. God, if we're not sure where we're at in our conflicts, that we take time to just prayerfully consider what happened. Where are we at? What's the level? What did I contribute? Father, be with us now as we head to small groups. Um, just whatever level our conversation goes to tonight, that would be just good. It would be honest. It would be vulnerable. It would be a great time to just think through these things and begin to apply them to our own lives. Um, God, one, so that we can be restored together, brothers and sisters, as the body of Christ, but also give you glory because you're doing amazing work in and through us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.